Ladies and gentlemen, the Vice President and I are very pleased to welcome you to our press conference. I would like to thank Governor Visco for his kind hospitality and express our special gratitude to his staff for the excellent organization of today's meeting of the Governing Council. We will now report on the outcome of our meeting. Based on our regular economic and monetary analysis, and in line with our forward guidance, we decided to keep the key CB interest rates unchanged. Following up on the decisions of 4 of September 2014, we also decided on the key operational details of both the asset-backed securities purchase program and the new covered bond purchase program. This will allow us to start purchasing cover bonds in mid-October and asset-backed securities in the fourth quarter of 2014. The programs will last for at least two years, together with a series of targeted longer-term refinancing operations, otherwise called TELTROS, to be conducted until June 2016, these purchases will have a sizable impact on our balance sheet. The new measures will support specific market segments that play a key role in the financing of the economy. They will thereby further enhance the functioning of the monetary policy transmission mechanism, facilitate credit provision to the broad economy, and generate positive spillovers to other markets. Taking into account the overall subdued outlook for inflation, the weakening in the euro area's growth momentum over the recent past and the continued subdued monetary and credit dynamics, our asset purchases should ease the monetary policy stance more broadly. They should also strengthen our forward guidance on the key ECB interest rates and reinforce the fact that there are significant and increased, increasing differences in the monetary policy cycle between major advanced economies. Together with the monetary accommodation already in place, the determined implementation of the new measures will underpin the firm anchoring of medium to long-term inflation expectations in line with our aim of maintaining inflation rates below but close to 2%. As all our measures work their way through to the economy, they will contribute to a return of inflation rates to levels closer to our aim. Should it become necessary to further address risks of too prolonged a period of low inflation, the Governing Council is unanimous in its commitment to using additional unconventional instruments within its mandate. A separate press release will provide further information on the modalities of our new purchase programs for ABSs and cover bonds, and it will be released at 3.30. Let me now explain our assessment in greater detail, starting with economic analysis. Following four quarters of moderate expansion, Euro area real GDP remained unchanged between the first and second quarter of this year. Survey data available up to September confirm the weakening in the euro area's growth momentum while remaining consistent with the modest economic expansion in the second half of the year. Looking ahead to 2015, the outlook for a moderate recovery in the euro area remains in place. But the main factors and assumptions shaping this assessment need to be monitored closely. Domestic demand should be supported by our monetary policy measures, the ongoing improvements in, in financial conditions, the progress made in fiscal consolidation, and structural reforms, and lower energy prices supporting real disposable income. Furthermore, demand for exports should benefit from the global recovery. At the same time, the recovery is likely to continue to be dampened by high unemployment, 
sizable unutilized capacity, continued negative bank loan growth to the private sector, and the necessary balance sheet adjustments in the public and private sectors. The risks surrounding the economic outlook for the euro area remain on the downside. In particular, the recent weakening in the euro area's growth momentum, alongside heightened geopolitical risks, could dampen confidence, and in particular, private investment. In addition, insufficient progress in structural reforms in euro area countries constitutes a key downward risk to the economic outlook. According to Eurostat's flash estimate, euro area annual HICP inflation was 0.3% in September 2014 after 0.4% in August. Compared with the previous month, this reflects a stronger decline in energy prices and a somewhat lower price increases in most other components of the HICP. On the basis of current information, annual HICP inflation is expected to remain at low levels over the coming months before increasing gradually during 2015 and 2016. The Garden Council will continue to closely monitor the risks to the outlook for price developments over the medium term. In this context, we will focus in particular on the possible repercussions of dampened growth dynamics, geopolitical developments, exchange rate developments, and the pass-through of our monetary policy measures. Turning to the monetary analysis, data for August 2014 continue to point to subdued underlying growth in broad money with the annual growth rate increasing moderately to 2% in August after 1.8% in July. Annual growth in M3 continues to be supported by its most liquid components with a narrow monetary aggregate M1 growing at an annual rate of 5.8% in August. The annual rate of change of loans to non-financial corporations remained negative at minus 2.0% in August after minus 2.2% in the previous month. On average, over recent months, net redemptions have moderated from the historically high levels recorded a year ago. Lending to non-financial corporations continues to reflect the lagged relationship with the business cycle, credit risk, credit supply factors, and the ongoing adjustment of financial and non-financial sector balance sheets. The annual growth rate of loans to households was 0.5% in August, broadly unchanged since the beginning of 2013. Against the background of weak credit growth, the ECB is now close to finalizing the comprehensive assessment of banks' balance sheets, which is of key importance to overcome credit supply constraints. To sum up, a cross-check of the outcome of uh, the economic analysis with the signals coming from the monetary analysis confirms the recent decisions taken by the Governing Council to provide further monetary policy accommodation and to support lending to the real economy. Monetary policy is uh, focused on maintaining price stability over the medium term and its accommodative stance contributes to supporting economic activity. However, in order to strengthen investment activity, job creation, and potential growth, other policy areas need to contribute decisively. In particular, the legislation and implementation of structural reforms clearly need to gain momentum in several countries. This applies to product and labor markets as well as to actions to improve the business environment for firms. As regards fiscal policies, euro area countries should not unravel the progress already made 
and should proceed in line with the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact. This should be reflected in the draft budgetary plans for 2015 that governments will now deliver, in which they will address the relevant country-specific recommendations. The pact should remain the anchor for confidence in sustainable public finances, and the existing flexibility within the rules should allow governments to address the budgetary costs of major structural reforms, to support demand, and to achieve a more growth-friendly composition of fiscal policies. A full and consistent implementation of the euro area's existing fiscal and macroeconomic surveillance framework is key to bringing down high public debt ratios, to raising potential growth, and to increasing the euro area's resilience to shocks. And we are now at your disposal for questions. Before we start, before we start can I just remind everyone to please ask two questions in maximum so that we can take as many different media as possible. And I will start with Alessandro Speciale from Bloomberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I have a first, this is Alessandro Speciale from Bloomberg News. My first question would be if you could give us some more details on the ABS purchase program. Uh, what will be the size, how it will evolve, uh, if the size of the purchase program will be changing over time, and also what, what about the rating of the ABS they will buy in the thinking uh, specifically about those from uh, Greece and Cyprus. And uh, my second question will be on the exchange rate. Uh, the euro is depreciated in recent weeks. Uh, and how do you evaluate this depreciation? And if you think this is a consequence of the ECB policies? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, a, a large, I mean, all the, all the details, almost all the details of the program will come out in the press release at 3.30, the specific ones. Let me say that uh, the three, pro it's, it's hard to give us, to assess a figure, to give a figure on, on this program as such, because there are several interactions between the ABS program, the cover bond program, and the Teltro program. So the overall impact of uh, these three measures uh, will be, on, on our balance sheet uh, size, will be, uh, will be significant. And our balance sheet is expected, as I think I said in the European Parliament, to, is expected to be stirred towards the dimension, the size it had at the beginning of 2012. The, on, on the ratings, again, the details will be in the press communique, but basically, basically, the existing, the AB, we've been accepting ABS in our collateral for 10 years. So it was quite natural to have as much similarity as possible with our collateral rules when we come to risk assessment. And, uh, and that's what's happened, basically. Uh, with a few adjustments that uh, are uh, uh, inspired by simple considerations. First of all, when we talk about an outright purchase, uh, it's kind of different than just uh, uh, lending against collateral on, which is with you on your, or, which is with you on a temporary basis. The second thing is that um, this program is uh, like the Teltros, is oriented to boost lending to SMEs. And that's why the ABS that we are focusing on are ABS that are meant to be simple and transparent. Namely, that the content of these ABSs ought to be loans and similar lending that it's easy to read and price and interpret. While in our collateral rules, we are accepting also structured ABS, we will not we would not orient our purchase program towards that sort of ABS because it would not be in sync with our objective to boost lending to the real economy. 
Third point is that uh, we want to be as inclusive as possible. Uh, so, as inclusive as possible, but with prudence. So that uh, we uh, have decided to uh, include countries that have a rating below tri triple B minus, uh, and uh, like Greece and Cyprus, applying certain derogation with two caveats. The first is that uh, there is a series of measures that mitigate risk for the specific purchases to happen there, that are to happen there, so that the assets bought there would be risk equivalent to assets bought elsewhere. So for example, size-wise, uh, type-wise, and then there is a second, uh, a second um, I would say, caveat of prudence, which is basically that uh, the countries ought to have an ongoing program with the EU. I think uh, I gave you the broad lines of what uh, we've decided, really. Then the rest will be, will be clearer in, uh, in the press communique. On the, on the exchange rate, well, you know, on the exchange rate, I've said several times, it's not a policy target for us. It's not a policy target, and uh, as far as the exchange rate communication is concerned, we'll uh, basically comply and attain to the agreed terms of reference in the G20 communique on this issue. It's, um, again, I did say this uh, on, on, other, on, other, on other occasions, it's, a, however, <clears throat> important for price stability and it's important for growth. And uh, to a great extent, the behavior we have seen is the outcome of the different economic situations, the different business, difference in our business cycle between us and the rest of most of the other jurisdictions, which in turn induces a difference and a diverging path in our monetary policies. Alessandro Merli. Alessandro Merli, Obil Sole, 24 Ore. Uh, your favorite measure of inflation expectations uh, has gone again down below uh, 2% the five year on five year. Uh, <coughs> do, you do you regard inflationary expectations still anchored at this stage? I'm sorry, what's the question? If you, if you regard the inflationary expectations still anchored as they've gone uh, down below 2% again uh, after briefly uh, uh, going up after your Jackson Hole speech. Uh, and the other question is given that your the measures you're proposing uh, today or the details of the measures you're proposing can only have an impact over a considerable period of time uh, if you're considering measures of more immediate impact, such as the purchase of uh, public sector or government bonds, and did any board, board members uh, propose that or suggest that at today's meeting? Well, first of all, uh, the inflation expectations, uh, first of all, we, we don't use, let me get this clear, because there has been a certain amount of misunderstanding in the last few weeks, we don't use one single measure of inflation expectations. We use a broad range of indicators. And uh, our inflation expectations measures have uh, gone down, especially on the short horizons, and uh, are now around uh, eight points below 2% on the five year on five year. And uh, so we look at that with um, definitely with great attention. I. I would say that the measures we've taken have been determined exactly because our medium-term outlook on inflation expectation has uh, worsened, and we see that uh, the risks have increased. So we, we, we think that, uh, and we said this uh, many times, we think that to have a prolonged period of too low inflation is harmful for the economy, and that's why the actions we've, uh, we've taken uh, since June onward are exactly meant to underpin our inflation expectations at 2% in the medium term. Uh, 
the other question was about the uh, yeah yeah there is no there is no there is no doubt that these measures like the Teltros and the ABS and the covered bond program will unfold over a certain horizon and um, we did a lot of things since June. I mean, we did a lot of unprecedented things now that you think, well, I mean, we lowered the interest rates and we went negative on the deposit, on the rate on the deposit facility. We launched this ABS program, which uh, wasn't, it's another unprecedented measure. We launched the third cover bond program uh, with ambitions and objectives way higher than the first and the second cover bond program. We launched the Teltros, Again, unprecedented in its shape. So let's see. But certainly, having said that, I just said how closely we are watching inflation and inflation expectations in the medium term. And I can only reiterate that the Governing Council stands is unanimous in its commitment to use other unconventional instruments if it were to judge that the risks of too low inflation for too prolonged a time were to deteriorate. Thank you. Gavin Jones, Reuters. Uh, yes, I have uh, w one question on the, the ECB's balance sheet and, and one question on, um, on the instruments <laughs> still at your disposal. On the uh, ECB balance sheet, you've said on several occasions you want to restore it to around the level it was in the, at the beginning of 2012. Um, if you could give markets slightly more precise guidance on that, because in the first quarter of 2012, I believe it oscillated between 2.5 and 3 trillion euros. Are we looking at the higher end of that or, or the lower end of that? Um, that's one question. And secondly, um, you said yesterday that uh, um, the monetary policy can only do so much in terms of reviving growth and confidence in the eurozone and you stressed in your introductory statement again today the importance of structural reforms, as you have done in the past, and also of respect for European budget rules. Um, does this mean that you are managed, you're running out of instruments or, or that uh, you won't do more until the governments do more? On, on, the on the first question, I mean, I understand your desire to have uh, very precise figures for everything. That makes life perhaps easier. Uh, but I have to say that uh, I wouldn't want to emphasize the balance sheet size per se. That's very important, but it's only an instrument. The ultimate and the only mandate that we have to comply is to bring inflation back to level that is close but below 2%. I think that's the ultimate yardstick by which we will measure the success of the present measures and any other measures that we we'll, may take in the future. On, uh, on the second point, uh, um, the question is, is actually quite, uh, quite uh, topical, I think. It's because there's no great bargain here. We do this if you do that. We know that our measures are going to be more effective or sometimes are effective only if other policies will be in place. Policies, and I've mentioned several times, policies on the demand side because more, the more we are in this situation, the more we see that the cyclical component in our business cycle is important and it's not only structural. It is true that to a great extent our problems are structural and that's why we need the second other policy, which is the one of structural reforms. So demand policies and structural reforms, we know that. But we also know that we want to comply with our mandate. So there is no bargain here. Each actor has its role to perform. Thank you. Domenico Conti, answer. Something wrong. Uh, Mr. President and uh, Governor Visco as well. Uh, I have 
A question regarding yeah the package of measures that have been launched by the ECB in June and that now are uh, taking place. Uh, first of all, um, there's the impression that such measures are uh, predominantly addressed in the supply side and that in some way uh, the demand is still suffering. Uh, in other words, I mean, for instance, why should companies borrow more in countries such as Italy when they do not see such uh, a, well, a, a significant improvement in demand and in growth? Uh, so isn't there a risk that the ECB is actually pushing on a string? Thank you very much. Well, certainly uh, that's what a central bank can do, and that's what we are doing namely improving the funding conditions for the main intermediation channel we have in this part of the world, namely the bank lending channel. As you know, it intermediates about 80% of credit flows. That's certainly the, our task, and uh, we've been doing uh, a lot. We've done a lot. I mean, you just go back with your memory to the last three years, and even four or five years, I mean, just we've done really a lot to improve the funding conditions. And now, of course, we are waiting, and we've seen some of it. We've seen that some of this is being passed very painfully slowly to the real economy. But certainly other measures are needed. I made several times the example of if someone, a young entrepreneur has to wait nine months, 12 months to have the authorizations and the permits to open a new shop. And then by the time he gets these authorizations, he is being overburdened by taxation of different kinds, you wouldn't expect him to apply for credit. And that's where the example tells that we need structural reforms as well. And finally, on the demand side, our rules are pretty clear. Countries that don't have fiscal space can still have fiscal space within the existing rules and we can dwell on that later on, they can also enforce what we've called growth-friendly fiscal consolidation based on cut in expenditures, cuts in taxes, increase in capital expenditures, and so on. And countries that do have fiscal space should use the fiscal space they have. So I think these three pronged program without implying any, as I said a minute ago, any bargain, any great bargain should be, should be in place. Brian Blackstone, Wall Street Journal. Hmm? Uh, Brian Blackstone with the, the Wall Street Journal. I just wanted to first of all press you a little bit more on this question on the exchange rate. Uh, you have commented before about the fundamentals for a weaker exchange rate being changing compared to, to previous months or weeks. You do say in the opening statement that, the, uh, that your, your policy should reinforce the fact that there are significant and increasing differences in monetary policy. Doesn't it stand to reason that these fundamentals for a weaker exchange rate are still valid in your opinion, despite even in light of the recent weakening that we've seen? And my second question is just a, a, maybe a bigger picture one on, on low inflation. Um, with a lot of people in Europe, families in Europe struggling, how can you tell them that, or explain to them that paying more at the gas station or the grocery store or the clothing store is ultimately in their interests, that higher inflation is, is good for them? Thank you. Yeah, let me, let me respond to the first question. I mean, you're trying to uh, kind of extort from me a level of the exchange rate, uh, and uh, unfortunately, I, I'm not in a position to, to accommodate your question there. Uh, we, we simply, as I said, the exchange rate is not a policy target, so we don't have a target other than we'll watch what happens in the markets as a result of our monetary policy decisions, which are taken with the primary and exclusive view of reestablishing price stability, bringing the inflation rate close but below to 2%. The second point is, um, is, is a good question. I think uh, we, we clearly, uh, we, by the way, we, we um, had a recent drop in oil prices by largely 
six percent at least in dollar prices and uh, that on one hand should support real incomes at the same time we are having uh, a very uh, very significant slack in the labor market which shows some marginal signs of stabilization but from a level of slack which is still very very significant we have uh, wide margins of unutilized capacity and um, and so on so the economy is still uh, fundamentally weak i've said many times our recovery is weak fragile uneven and um, and still is so the uh, the hope is that when we see some price uh, I would say some p price pressure some price power back in the economy at the same time we'd like to see also some strengthening in the economy that would be the objective and in a sense the first is should ideally be the outcome of the second and uh, on this is is partly predicated our uh, conviction that uh, in, uh, in the medium term inflation will go back to 2% as the economy will strengthen. Stefania Tamburello. <coughs> Stefania Tamburello, Corriere della Sera. About the Tercio. Um, Mr. President and Governor Visco. Uh, can Teltro be used to allow firms to anticipate part of to TFR to employees? Is this the only question? Okay, that's for Governor Visco. <laughs> <laughs> he is very nice. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, well, TLTRO has a clear objective to increase lending to small and medium enterprises. If that uh, opens a way for uh, small and medium enterprises to do more lending, then obviously there is nothing against that. But in any case, uh, banks are free to do what they like, uh, what they think is more important for them and also for the economy that they serve. And the TLTROs are there to be judged against the increase of lending vis-a-vis -vis the reference path. That's it. Thank you. Annette Weisbach, CNBC. Um, Mr. President, I have two questions. One on um, your answer on uh, that also countries who, are, uh, who do have an ongoing program with the EU are eligible for ABS purchases. So what about Greece? It's formally ending at the end of 2014 with the EU but it's ongoing with the IMF. Is that also eligible, or does Greece need an, a certain, another program? And the second question uh, would be on um, what are you making of the recent advent or rise of Euroscepticism in, Euro in the Eurozone's biggest economy, Germany? It seems that it's so, sort of an equation. The more you venture into uncon unconventional territory, the more Euroscepticism is on the rise in Germany. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Well, let me just w add one comma to what uh, Governor Viscos just said. The Teltros are exactly devised to make sure that banks lend what they borrow from the ECB. If they don't lend, they will have to repay everything. So that's, uh, that's, that's important to remember because that's what makes these things different from the previous operations. On Greece, yes, uh, they, it must be a program there. And uh, the specific shape of the program you'll see in the press release attached, but there must be a program. There must be, and if no program, no purchases. I'm sorry? Well, that's what you find in the press uh, uh, communique, which comes out at 3.30. A, a precise definition of what we mean by that. On, um, on a Euro skepticism, uh, it's... Uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very understandable that uh, people are Eurosceptical because things uh, are uh, not going well in opposite directions. In, uh, in this part of the world, things are not going well because you have a pervasive unemployment 
and uh, you have a very low uh, weak economic activity with, uh, and in some countries with a recession that seems to never end. So you can't expect people being enthusiastic about that. In the other part of Europe, uh, you have this because they feel like they, people are paying for everybody else. And, uh, and so that's also a reason for not being happy. Having said that, I don't think that the euro is uh, a solution to the problems. The countries that need to do structural reforms would have to do anyway, would have to do it anyway, whether they are in the euro or outside the euro. The countries that need to consolidate their public finances would have to do it anyway. And one could even argue that uh, some, con for some forms of fiscal consolidation, some forms of structural reforms would even be more difficult and more costly outside. But this is a, as being a counterfactual. I wouldn't, I wouldn't see too much on that. So uh, this, uh, this idea is, um, is understandable, but I don't think it's right. And uh, I will only repeat, the euro is irreversible. Johanna Trigg. Thank you. Johanna Trigg, Market News. Um, Mr. Draghi, I would like to go back to the balance sheet. Um, so the early 2012 level, is that, um, is that merely an expectation um, of the effect of current measures, um, or is it more of a target so that you should banks um, show very limited interest in the second TLTO, you might actually go ahead and purchase an asset more, more aggressively than uh, you're planning currently. Um, and my second question related to that, it's more of a target or even just uh, in, in a, a rough aim, by what time would you like to get there and for how long would you like to maintain that level? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, again, I mean, uh, what I can say is that we've decided a massive amount of measures now. We haven't seen yet their impact in the economy. Uh, so we expect these measures to stir our balance sheet towards that time, but don't forget that our ultimate test is the expectation of inflation expectations. And that we are going to gear our action according to how the medium term outlook of our inflation expectations will develop in the coming months. It's not coming years, coming months. So we do expect that our measures uh, will have a sizable impact. Uh, that's quite understandable that we expect that. And uh, what was the second question? Well, I mean, as, as I said, like we, uh, the answer to the first is also the answer to the second. <laughs> we simply have to look at our medium term inflation expectations outlook, and then we will decide. And we have to see what impact these measures are having. So. Well, and we have to see exactly, I've, I've, um, I've said that, uh, said one more thing. The potential universe that these two programs will address, uh, the cover bond progress purchase and the, um, and the uh, asset, the ABS uh, purchase program, potential universe is up to one trillion. That doesn't mean, of course, that we will go into that amount. It will mean that that's the potential uni universe to which our purchases will be addressed. On top of this, we will be having the impact of the Teltros. So I think the, the groundwork for having a sizable impact is there. We do expect this to have an, an impact on our ultimate yardstick, which is the inflation expectation in the medium term. And having said that, I will reiterate saying that the Governing Council is unanimous in its commitment to use other unconventional instruments. You see, this sentence is, is repeated, introductory statement after introductory statement each and every time. This means that in spite of the measures that we've just taken between June and September, the Governing Council still stands ready to undertake other measures if needed. Um, Ms. Polidoro. <laughs> um, 
President Draghi, please. Um, uh, uh, yesterday, France decided not to respect uh, the um, deficit limit. And uh, rightly, this morning, uh, the Italian Prime Minister said, defended the, their choice, and uh, actually added uh, that nobody could, uh, could treat the, um, the partner as a pupil. So what is going on? What's your opinion? Uh, I mean, uh, does it change uh, uh, the situation in the European uh, economic monetary system? What's your opinion on that? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, well, first, uh, first let me say that uh, uh, the Euro area member states, I'm pretty sure Euro area member states, the Commission, the ECB, uh, all of us have uh, a, an enormous uh, interest in, uh, in uh, having France returning to growth and lowering unemployment. This is, um, this is, we should start from this point. Second point is that we, we do trust the government to take uh, the, all the necessary actions on uh, the structural reform ground, starting with a, with a forceful implementation of the Responsibility Pact, but also with the forceful implementation of other reforms. You know, here I had a chance to say in, uh, in some, not long ago in, in an interview in France in, in, uh, with, with, a French, uh, with a French channel that uh, these reforms have been uh, studied and designed for a long time. Now it's implementation time. And that's where the focus should be. On the specific fiscal issues, let me read the policy guidance that the European Council, you know the European Council is formed by all our leaders, so including the French leaders. The policy guidance that the European Council adopted in July by recommending to France to first reinforce the budgetary strategy for the year 2014 and beyond, Second, achieving the structural adjustment effort specified in the Council recommendation under the excessive deficit procedure. And third, ensure the correction of the excessive deficit in a sustainable manner by 2015. Now, having said that, we will have a full discussion of this, the first full discussion of this, when the French government will present the draft budget uh, in October, yeah, I think in a couple of weeks or in a week time, and then we will have this discussion in November, early November. So it's too early to, to elaborate any further. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Claire Jones, Financial Times. Um, Mr. President, for my first question, um, how concerned is is the ECB about the recent fall in core inflation and also reports from the manufacturing PMI yesterday that businesses are cutting prices across the region. Um, secondly, there's been some protests on the streets of Naples today. I was wondering if you have any message at all for the protests which seem to be centered around complaints over European institutions and austerity. Well, you're right to point out as a, as a, as a meaningful uh, figure that has just come out, the fall in core inflation. Because as a matter of fact, uh, this uh, we've observed certainly a drop, uh, a, a quite a significant drop in energy prices, uh, but also in other components, several other components of the HICP. So that's certainly uh, something that we are looking, and as I think I read in the introductory statement, we are moni closely monitoring these developments. The, but, but there's one thing to say, basically, that um, for quite a prolonged period of time, the drop in oil and, and more generally energy prices and the drop in food prices was the greatest explanation, the most significant explanation for the low inflation. Then 
once the dollar prices of these two categories pretty much stabilized, it was the strong appreciation of the exchange rate which continued to have an impact on low inflation. More recently, we see that uh, the uh, forecast error that's being made in forecasted inflation cannot be attributed only to the assumptions on oil prices, food prices, and the exchange rate, but there is also another component which certainly contains unemployment, certainly contains the weak level of aggregate demand. And basically says that the longer we stay in a low inflation situation, the more the cyclical component gains importance and contributes to inflation. I think this is one way we look at this new data about, uh, and so it produces falling prices in components other than energy and food. The, the second question is, uh, well, it's uh, uh, while while I think I think we have a, a, a understanding for the reasons that are behind these uh, these protests, and um, we understand the, the reasons, and and, and and frankly have to do with uh, with what I said before, namely the weak situation of this uh, of this country, the the weak economy, and so on. But what I find um, what I find uh, in uh, in need to be corrected is the perception that the ECB is somehow at the origin of, uh, is guilty, and is at the origin of this, uh, of this situation. I mean, it's simply, what is needed is to go back and ask yourself, how, we, how were you two and a half years ago, three years ago? What was the situation? The financial system seemed to be on the verge of collapsing. Interest rates were several hundreds basis points higher than they are today. The ECB has injected, unpre well, first of all, has lowered interest rates so much that now we are close to zero and we can't go down any longer. And as I said, no other greater central bank is now having banks paying for depositing money with the central bank. Second, we have injected unprecedented amounts of liquidity in the system. Third, we just approved now another series of measures. Fourth, we have successfully fought a crisis of systemic proportions in 2012, which actually led to lowering all the interest rates on on various components. So the, uh, I, find, um, I find this, uh, the description of the ECB as the guilty actor here uh, in need to be corrected. That's, um, thank you. Do you want to add anything? No, I think it's correct. I mean, this is, this is exactly what I think. Uh, these protests cannot be against monetary policy. Monetary policy has been uh, clearly as easy as possible and will continue to be until the, the, the objectives are reached. But uh, it is against the state of the economy, which has a number of causes. To identify the causes is complicated. To identify the answers is complicated. And uh, usually this is uh, a response that identifies the central bank with the banks and it, has, it is need to be corrected. It identifies the ECB monetary policy with the decisions of uh, the Troika, but the Troika does not make decisions. The Troika somehow is uh, a surveying, surveyor of decisions taken by the governments. So it is uh, an issue of politics. It's not an issue of monetary policy. Um, Rossella Bocelli. Yeah. Yesterday night, uh, Mr. Visco said that the, cho the choice of Naples uh, represents a way to remind us that as Naples is a melting pot of different historical experiences, so is Europe. Uh, does monetary policy today take into account the dualism of European economy and how? And I would like to address the, the same question to Mr. Draghi and to Mr. Visco. Please, Mr. Visco. 
Well, first of all, uh, Naples was chosen uh, as uh, the third country where the ECB Six. Governing Council meets. Uh, one was in the north, it was Venice, the other was in the center is Rome. The third is Naples. These are three very important uh, cities in the history of Europe, not only in the history of, uh, of Italy. Then the questions, with substantial questions, is when uh, one takes monetary decisions, does it uh, imply that uh, a particular situation is considered or not? There are two answers. The first, all situations are considered. The second, we take decisions looking at the area as a whole. So uh, clearly it is very important what happens in particular regions for the area as a whole, and we have to take that into consideration. But clearly monetary policy is not selective. It does not address a particular development issue in a particular region or a particular uh, circumstance uh, which really is local rather than affecting the whole economy of the Euro area. Nothing to add. In which case, we'll take the final question now. And as a tribute to the host country, I would like uh, the president, if possible, to answer in Italian so that the TV stations can, can also have something um, in Italian. Could I please ask Rai, Mr. Di Mario? Thank you, President Draghi, for taking a question in Italian. It's on behalf of Italian TV viewers. What can monetary policy do in order to support real economy? Monetary policy in the last four or five years was very, very active. It supported real economy, it improved the financial conditions of banks so as to make it possible for banks to loan money to real economy. Up to uh, 2012, interest rates were far higher than they are today. We brought interest rates down to zero virtually. And at this point in time, it is necessary for banks to transfer these conditions uh, to uh, companies and entrepreneurs and households. Therefore, monetary policy can improve conditions uh, for the financing of the economy, but other conditions must exist so that people go to the bank and borrow money. They have to be confident in the future. Confidence in the future is a precondition for new investments, new companies, and for uh, borrowing from banks. The general conditions must change. Less taxes, more reforms, certainty about public finance orientations. And I'm saying this not because I'm thinking of Italy alone. I've been, think, I've been saying these things for the whole of Europe. The measures we discussed today already impacted the situation. They brought interest rates even lower. They affected the exchange rate market. Therefore, the great uncertainty that affected financial markets in the past has virtually disappeared. But uncertainty disappeared on the financial markets, not uh, in the world of real economy. And that's where we need to uh, make steps forward. Excuse me. I repeat what I said earlier in English. Our monetary policies accompanied the growth of problems all over the era, but it also helped reduce uh, the constraints on the supply of credit. There are other conditions, however, which should uh, uh, which require uh, an overall action, because only in these conditions can you uh, think of investing money, but uh, our monetary 
monetary policy strongly supported uh, the economy with a reduction of the strong risk which uh, characterized the euro area as a whole and Italy, in particular, linked as it was to the euro and the crisis of sovereign debt uh, of 2011-2013. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.